Hey, and welcome to Southridge Church Online Catalyst Service. We're really glad that you're with us. My name is Anna. I'm the youth pastor here at Southridge Church. And let me tell you something. I am far from being a teenager anymore, but since I work with teens, I do know this one thing. Teenagers say weird things. Like instead of saying, for example, um, oh yeah, that's true. They might say, oh, no cap. Or instead of saying, well, what are the details? They might say, what's the T? You know, things that don't make sense. But we can't say that today's teens started this. This has been happening throughout time. I mean, you did this, I'm sure too. So in the comments, go ahead and tell us what is a phrase or word that kind of dates you, that lets us know what time frame you grew up in. What were the happening words, as they would say? Let us know in the comments. I think this will be pretty fun to look at. So it's not just words that get skewed throughout time though, is it? Like meanings and intentions and even designs for things become different. And I think that one of the greatest examples of this is sex and marriage. I mean, from the very beginning, God designed marriage and sex. He called the shots on that. We didn't invent that. He did. And he did it because he loves people so much. We were his greatest creation. The thing that he found the most joy in. So of course he wanted more. He wanted us to procreate and he made it such a, an extravagant and wonderful thing to exist. But because of Adam and Eve's sin against God and their disobedience, everything good that God made has a stain of sin on it. And it feels like the further we get from the original design, the, the bigger and the darker that stain becomes. I know that our world tells us that there's one way to experience marriage or there's another way to experience relationship and another way to experience sexual relationships. But God originally called the shots on those things. He's the original design maker. And if we can put aside the illusions that the world gives us, then we can find our focus back on the design that God had. This is kind of what Paul is helping the Corinthian church do. So we're in a series called Problem Child. Paul is, the Apostle Paul is getting gray hairs, you guys, from this church, from these believers. They are really pushing him a little bit to the max. They've got all these issues. And so we're going to see another week of how Paul is addressing the problems that the church is having and this week, you guessed it, sex and marriage. It's going to be awesome. Before we get into it, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Um, I just am so grateful even right now that I can be united with people on the other side of a screen. Like you did that too. Thank you, God. Like it's so cool. And your word doesn't stop. It's not confined by our presence together but it's defined and confined in you alone. So God, right now, allow us to find wisdom in your word, um, to find love and compassion that you have for us in your word. And God, help us to see your word clearly today for what it is. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're here together, problem child. Let's check it out. The issue of the day that Paul was dealing with we're in chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and the issue of the day is that there are some Corinthians that thought that they were so super spiritual that they didn't have to worry about what they did with their bodies. They could just do whatever they wanted, no consequences, because they're so spiritual, like nothing can hurt them. Paul addresses this issue. He kind of nips it, and he's, you know, reminding them as much as we need to be reminded that we not we need not be disillusioned, but instead be determined in devotion to Christ. And in verse one, we're going to just kind of see this out. So first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, and we'll go all the way through two together. 
Now for the matters you wrote about, is it good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman? But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. So this idea of doing whatever they want with their bodies, um, you know, whatever they want with whoever they want, Paul is saying, hey, look, like there is a time and a place and there is a proper expression of your bodies with other bodies and that's within marriage that's within marriage and he's being pretty clear about it now there's a flip side to the coin there's the people that are super spiritual saying i can do whatever i want and then there's the people that are super spiritual saying i have super spiritual control and i can override natural sexual desires my natural sexual appetite i can override that because i'm so spiritual paul sees this as not a good thing either let's check it out verse five he says do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer then come together again so that satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control paul says husbands and wives they should not deprive each other of sex like if they're married that is something that should be allowed and should have its proper healthy place get this as a spiritual practice in marriage like this is something that actually can help married people grow in god because it's an it can become an appreciation for what god has designed for married people like that's crazy but paul goes on to state in the following verses that some people may end up married some people may not and he marks both options as a gift from god both things can be a gift from god and then he kind of hits this part that in my opinion almost sounds a little wishy-washy um, all the way through verse 16 it's almost like he's going back and forth about marriage and divorce and and um, believers that are married and non-believers that are married like just kind of this mixed up mess but he clears it all up he clears it all up in verse 17 and this is what he says if you got your bible follow along because um this part is what i see as the overarching theme through the rest of it verse 17 he says nevertheless each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the lord has assigned to them just as god has called them this is the rule i lay down to all the churches paul is concerned not just about you know what their physical involvement is with others but he's concerned with their attitudes he's concerned that um they be focused on christ be focused on the mission that god has called them to first and foremost now when it says um whatever situation god has assigned to you sometimes we end up in circumstances that don't feel very fair right maybe we're married and things feel incredibly unfair or maybe we're single and things feel incredibly unfair god is not dismissing that he's not dismissing your circumstances and it's not saying that he's pleased necessarily when we're doing poorly or when we're being treated poorly what he's saying is if we find ourselves in this arena of marriage as being a focal point for us whether we're single wanting to be married or married wanting to be single or married wanting something else from the marriage whatever it is these are all tension points these are all moments where god is not celebrating our tension instead god wants our contentment to not be in those things to not be in marriage or the desire to be married but he wants our spiritual contentment to be in him like he wants us to be free of uh, circumstantial dependence like our circumstances should not determine whether or not we can depend on God 
our number one provider is always going to be God. We need to press into a determined devotion in Christ, no matter if we're married or not married. This is kind of what Paul is reminding these Christians of. Now, this isn't to say that we can't try to improve our situation. Actually, Paul hits this in verse 21. He says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let that trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. You know, where were you whenever you decided to follow Jesus for the first time? Like, what kind of relationship were you in? What kind of life circumstance were you in? Don't let it trouble you. Like, don't let those things take your focus off of Christ. But also, if you're given opportunities to improve your, your circumstance, to improve your situation, do it. Like, those things are good for you, but we should keep an attitude that trusts God first, that trusts God to know what's best. If you're keeping this attitude to trust God to know, like trusting God to know what's best, then when you see opportunities to move beyond where you are, there's a really good chance you'll be able to take them with a confident hope that God is with you in it. That's kind of what Paul is, is hinting at here a little bit as well. I know that in our culture, I actually heard this on the news, I think the other day, someone said the power of positive thinking um, and that's, that is a powerful thing to think positively about your circumstances. Um, but for believers, it's really not just the power of positivity. It's the power of the Holy Spirit transforming our attitudes towards all areas of life, not just marriage and sex, but in all different aspects of our life allowing the Holy Spirit to transform the way that we view these things. So in addition to the attitude and the heart of the issue, Paul's also going to share some external factors that can bring tension in marriage and singleness um, for believers. And so that's kind of where we're gonna take a shift into verse 26. And this is what Paul says. He says, because of the present crisis, I think it is a good thing for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Then don't seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Don't look for a wife. But if you do not marry, you, sorry, but if you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this. So Paul, like, He's very well aware of the tension point that is um, in the life of a true believer. In the life of someone who's chasing after Jesus, here's the tension. Life, the world, things it has to offer, God, eternity, the things he has to offer. There's tension in that. And when it, whenever you feel that tension, Paul is saying in relationships, in marriage, in singleness, don't let that add more to your plate. Like that tension is enough. Don't let it add more to your plate. I, I don't know if you're the type of person that adds things to your own plate, but that kind of sounds like the type of people Paul's talking to. Uh, tell us in the comments on a scale of one to 10, are you the kind of person that just adds more to your plate? 10 being like, yes, I literally take on so many responsibilities and worries and concerns that aren't mine. It's just who I am as a human. Or one being like, no, I really kind of don't do that stuff. I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on that. Paul's going to continue his stance in verse 32. Let's go there. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, but he, sorry, and how he can please the Lord. But a man who is married is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live right in a way that is undivided 
and devotion to the Lord. Paul is saying unmarried believers can devote everything they have to God. There's really no other distractions. However, someone who has a spouse, God wants you to devote yourself to that spouse. So there are some, there is some tension in that, like devoting your time properly there and devoting it properly to God. Um, specifically, since this was a very difficult time for believers, enduring a lot of persecution, um, people who were married would just find their life to be a little bit more complex at this time. Believers, they were distracted, they were disillusioned, and they were lacking a devotion to Christ at this time. In addition to being um, fully committed to one another, like Paul says in verses 3 through 5, He's also telling married couples, married Christian couples, to be unattached to the things of this world. Their attitudes should acknowledge the fact that there is something that is ultimately more significant than their marriage. I love my marriage. I really, I love Paul. Like, Paul, you're watching this later. I love you. And I don't want to get too sappy because that's kind of gross. But, like, I know in my heart, and I know that Paul knows this too, like our marriage is someday going to end. Like, because one of, we, we're not gonna live here forever. Like, it, it doesn't work like that. But until death, we have vowed to hang in there with each other. Now, Paul is reminding us that in these, in these passages, he's reminding us that when our attention is fully in relationships, we're missing a big part of the picture and that is our allegiance to God our devotion to God as first place is getting robbed I don't know if you've experienced a whole lot as a Jesus follower but whenever I am fully following God being diligent in my devotion to Christ I'm a better wife. I'm a better sibling. I'm a better daughter. I'm a better friend. And it has nothing to do really with me. It has everything to do with God overflowing from me. God's love and his compassion, his peace, and, and his um, gifts that he gives us. It just overflows into the world around us. So if you haven't tried that, try chasing after God with everything you have and letting the overflow fill those other relationships. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised at how amazing God can make that happen. So this involves some scary thoughts though, like to think, oh, I'm detached from this world. I'm detached from the things of this world. Like, detached doesn't mean disowned. You're still very much taking ownership over the things that God has gifted you, your family, your spouse, your friendships, your responsibilities as a Christ follower to spread the gospel. Those things are still very much um, a part of your, your regular life, but you're detached from the idea of those being a focus. So whether you're married or unmarried, young, old, male, female, I'm going to ask you this. Um, tell us in the comments why you find it easy or difficult to detach yourself from the things of this world. Why do you find it easy or difficult to detach yourself from the things of this world? Curious to see your thoughts on that. Um, I know Paul, a big part of his drive was because he was very concerned that Jesus would come back any moment. And so he was very urgent with this message and very urgent with all of his messages um, because he's like, we don't have much time. We don't have much time. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. Verse 36, let's pick back up. If anyone's worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the virgin he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. But the man who settled the matter in his own mind, who's under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, 
and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry does better. Verse 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she's happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So as we kind of wrap up this chapter, we see, you know, Paul giving his opinions, which he's very clear about his opinions. You know, he's not against marriage or married believers, but based on what he is sharing and what he's experienced in, you know, the lives of believers, he's saying marriage can be a really big distraction from the main goal, which is uh, a believer's devotion to God and advancing the gospel. Paul's pro-singleness is simply just a product of this troubled climate. It's, it's a product of um, the persecution. It's a product of the possibility of Jesus's return any second. It's the positive, it's the, it's um, like the product of the diligent mission of the church moving forward with the gospel message. All of these things are reasons why Paul is suggesting this type of change to be avoidable. Marriage, um, singleness, issues involving that. He's saying, if you can avoid these things, do it. If you can avoid extra trouble, do it. Because what God has for you is so important, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Now, at the end, I just want to add this because I thought this was borderline humorous um paul says that i too have the spirit of god he's saying this because so many people were calling themselves super spiritual saying things like god told me to tell you this like blah, blah, blah whatever and so paul adds this to his saying you know like i don't think that what they're saying is true because it doesn't match up with anything else god has ever said and I'm declaring that the Spirit of God is with me, validating my advice to you. So just a little extra tidbit from Paul to these people and to us today. You know, this is wise advice from him. It's not necessarily um, God's rules or commands. It's simply Paul's Holy Spirit wise advice to the believers. And we can take this today and learn from it as well a couple things i want to kind of end with is like we need to consider that this is paul's advice um it is backed a lot of it is backed by god's design so be mindful of that as you pile through this um and be reminded also that paul's advice was shaped by the world that he was in it was shaped by the persecution and all of these other things that were happening. Um, his, his thoughts were really thought out, um, practical descriptions of how you could live in the current climate and be the best follower of Christ that you could. That's gonna be different for you and I. That might be unique to you and I. We have to do our due diligence in following after God wholeheartedly to determine what that is for each of us as well. So I end by asking you, are you going to be a problem child? Like, are you going to concern yourself with the temporary things that the world has to offer? Or are you going to commit all of these things to God and put him first in your life and allow through your love and devotion to him, allow overflow to happen into all these other relationships. If you are in a relationship that is unhealthy, that is leading to pain or abuse, please know that God does not want that for you. He absolutely wants his kids to have the best possible life, and that is not a part of it. So reach out for help. Reach out to a trusted friend, a pastor, a trained professional, authorities, whatever it takes because God hates to see his kids hurting. 
if you are going through something that is bigger than a sit down conversation or a mediation, reach out for help. Relationships take work, but sometimes real things are beyond our control. So reach out if you need that. We wanna encourage you to do that today. Friends, last but not least, don't be disillusioned by this world. Don't be disillusioned by the things that relationships, sex, marriage, divorce, culture want you to believe. Instead, find yourself determined in your devotion to Christ today and every day by putting Jesus first in your life. God wants you. He wants you. He's always wanted you. But because of sin, he can't have you. Jesus makes it possible for God to have you and to give you all the love and the care that you so desperately deserve and maybe desire. Allow him today to come into your life in a fresh new way and devote yourself to him. From myself and all of us here at Southridge Church, we love you and we can't wait to see you next time.